of all the many types of living things that walk, crawl, fly, swim, or simply grow on the face of the earth. There are none so impressive as the insects. They come in a variety beyond imagining. Scientists have identified more than half a million different kinds, and new ones are being added to the list all the time. Incredible things, the insects. They add beauty to our world. They provide food by pollinating the fruit trees. They produce the delicious nectar of honey. And they're a source of various medicines. Yet for all their good, we know them best by the problems they cause. For almost every type of food that man eats, for almost every type of material that man uses, there is some insect that thrives on it. We've learned a lot in the past 50 years about how to keep insects in check. But sometimes our best efforts fail. When that happens, the answer may be counterattack by fumigating with aluminum phosphide. This film will show you the techniques and safety precautions for carrying out aluminum phosphide fumigation. The first question is, when do you fumigate? There are certain conditions under which some items are routinely fumigated to prevent insects. For example, during a spell of hot, humid weather, highly susceptible foods are normally fumigated in transit. Occasionally, it may be necessary to fumigate on arrival. Current instructions will provide you specific guidance on when to do this type of fumigation. Also, outgoing rail shipments of some goods are routinely fumigated during the summer months. We'll talk about in-transit fumigation later in the film. Most of the time, though, fumigation is not something you do to prevent insects. It's what you do after prevention has failed. When you find that insects have gotten into the stored product, it's time to fumigate. In this case, an inspection has discovered that these 16 pallets are infested and it's time to prepare for fumigation. To help you determine the length of the fumigation period, you will need to know the temperature of the commodity. It's not the air temperature that matters, but the temperature of the materials in the stack. If the temperature is above 70 degrees, you'll fumigate for the standard time, three days. Between 60 and 70 degrees, refer to the label on the aluminum phosphide container and to the Armed Forces Pest Control Board handbook. If the stack temperature is below 60 degrees, you must consult the command or staff entomologist for his approval and instructions. You'll also need to measure and record the dimensions of the stack to help you later determine the amount of fumigant needed for the job. Of all the things you will ever know about insecticides, the most important is they are not dangerous as long as you use them properly. But you cannot afford to grow careless or take them for granted. Some of them can kill if you don't follow the precautions. That's especially true of the chemical you'll use for fumigating, aluminum phosphide. 
For your own protection, there are a number of safety rules that have to be followed. Always wear protective gloves when you handle aluminum phosphide. You don't need to be wearing a gas mask, but you must have one with you and available just in case. The canister must indicate that it is for use with aluminum phosphide. It may be listed by the word phosphine or by the chemical initials AL, PH3. Another requirement is that there must always be at least two people present when you use this chemical. And at least one of the people must have a certificate as a trained insecticide handler. The certificate must be renewed every two years to be valid. There are some other safety precautions as well, which we'll talk about later on. Now, how much fumigant will be needed? The label on the container gives the dosage. It's based on how many cubic feet are in the stack you're going to fumigate. Multiply height times width times length to get the cubic footage. From that, you calculate the number of tablets or pellets to use. You can also reach the same answer by using information given in the pamphlet of the Armed Forces Pest Control Board. To make sure you aren't leaving out any important steps, you should make it a habit to use checklists for fumigation. As one example, it will keep you from forgetting that there are a number of people who must be notified before you do any fumigation. With today's modern chemicals, fumigation is much simpler than it used to be. There's no need to move the stack. The job can be done with safety right in the middle of the warehouse. The technique you're going to use involves covering the entire stack with polyethylene, making it airtight, and then placing the chemical inside. After covering the stack, inspect the polyethylene all over for tears or holes. Be very thorough about this inspection. The success of the fumigation depends on keeping the gas inside the tent. If it can leak out, your entire effort will be wasted. All holes your inspection reveals must be sealed with pressure sensitive tape. Corners and other sharp edges need careful taping to prevent snagging and tearing. You'll also need to tape the corner flaps to keep the polyethylene from billowing as the gas forms. Leave at least an 18 inch overlap all the way around so you have a place to put down the sand snakes to seal the edges. Now it's time for the chemical. First, gloves on, gas masks handy. Open the container of aluminum phosphide. Place in the tray the approximate number of tablets or pellets that you previously figured out you should use. But here's an important caution. Never leave the chemical piled up like this. Such a pile of aluminum phosphide could fuse together and actually explode. Here's the right way. Spread them out so they aren't touching. 
This also makes it easier to obtain an accurate count. Don't forget to cap the container as soon as you finish your count. To place the chemical inside the airtight polyethylene tent, first cut a small opening. Insert the tray of aluminum phosphide. Then seal the opening with the pressure sensitive tape. The gloves are now contaminated. They cannot be simply thrown away, but must be either burned or buried. One of the final things you need to do is to rope off the area. The rope barricade and warning signs will alert warehouse personnel to stay clear during the fumigation period. There's nothing you need to do, meanwhile, except take gas readings at 24-hour intervals. First, to be sure of your safety, take a reading in the open air near the stack using a low-range detection tube. If you have sealed the polyethylene properly, there should not be any gas getting out. Switching to a high-range tube, measure the gas level inside the polyethylene to be sure it's strong enough for a good insect kill. After you've taken the reading, simply tape over the hole using the pressure sensitive tape. The reading just after fumigating must be at least 300 parts per million as indicated by the dark area of the tube. And it must remain above 200 parts per million throughout the process. You need to take and record the readings at 24, 48, and 72 hours. It's very important that you continue the fumigation for the full time required. Remember that temperature of the stack may affect the fumigation time. Clearing the stack at the end of the time is, again, a job that must be done by two people for safety reasons, and this time wearing the gas masks. The warehouse doors should be open and the ventilators on to provide good cross ventilation. Lift up the polyethylene all the way around to clear out any remaining gas. Warehouse personnel should be cautioned against entering the building during the airing out period. As soon as you've got it airing out, recover the ash residue and then leave the vicinity for at least an hour. Notice that the pellets have turned completely to a powder. Carry the trays out of doors. The bucket contains a liquid detergent. Carefully pour in the powder and stir well. In case there are any particles of the chemical that have not reacted, this will neutralize them. Dispose of the mixture as prescribed by current regulations. The trays and gloves must be disposed of by burial. If you have followed the instructions precisely, all insects in the stack are now dead. Note that phosphine gas does not leave any chemical residue in the food. Food products are perfectly safe to eat any time beyond 48 hours after fumigation with aluminum phosphide.
On the other hand, fumigation will not keep insects from coming back again later on, so all the usual preventive measures still have to be taken. In transit, fumigation is a preventive method. The purpose is to keep the food products from being infested by insects hiding in the freight car. You use in-transit fumigation for all shipments of specified food products that leave the depot during the months from May through October. Here's the procedure you will follow. The first step for in-transit fumigation is preparation of the rail car. Unfortunately, most freight cars are not in very good condition. To ready one for use, you must thoroughly clean it. Then patch, caulk, or tape all cracks and openings. By the time you're done, the car must be thoroughly airtight. Sometimes the only satisfactory way to prepare the floor is just to cover the whole thing with polyethylene. Tape the edges all the way around. Put down sheets of cardboard to protect the polyethylene from tearing when the forklifts drive over it. The inside of the door you're not going to use for loading can be sealed with craft paper. When the car is fully prepared, it can be loaded in the normal manner. Now you're ready for the final step, fumigating. Although there are several ways to mount the aluminum phosphide in the car, the most common way is by means of envelopes made of a special material that lets the gas pass through. A maximum of 10 pellets, or two tablets, go in each one. Again, the total number you use depends on the cubic footage. This is normally marked right on the side of the car. The filled envelopes are mounted on a piece of cardboard. Staple them in a shingled arrangement, but be sure to make the rows far enough apart so that the tablets or pellets in one envelope are not directly over the ones in another envelope. The completed cardboard gets mounted inside the car, alongside the doors, and about a foot higher than the top layer of the load. The chemical or residue must never come into direct contact with food goods. All that remains is to post a warning sign inside the car opposite the door. The sign opposite the other door was put on the pallet before loading. Close and seal the door using a waterproof tape. Post the outside warning signs on both exterior doors. Note the information that must be contained on a rail car warning sign. 
hour and date of fumigation, hour and date the car doors may be opened, number of bags, envelopes, or other containers, and your name and phone number. The last step is sealing the door with a yellow metal or plastic fumigation tag marked ALP fumigated. Now the other side of the coin. What do you do on receiving a car that's been fumigated? First of all, a fumigated rail car must be opened only by qualified pest control operators. There's a danger for untrained personnel who could expose themselves to harmful levels of the gas. Check when the car was fumigated to make certain that three full days have elapsed. If not, don't open the car until the three days are up. Any time after that, the doors can be opened. Do not enter the car yet. Allow it to air out for at least one hour. When the car is well ventilated, you can put on gloves and gas mask and go in to bring out the phosphide. As an added safety precaution, one man remains outside the car while the other retrieves the chemical. The shipper may have used any of three forms of aluminum phosphide. Pellets or tablets and envelopes, powder-filled bags, or prepackaged pellets. Each manufacturer provides information about the handling and disposal of aluminum phosphide. You are governed, however, by the procedures outlined in Military Standard 1486, or the Technical Information Memorandum Number 11 of the Armed Forces Pest Control Board. After you have removed all the fumigant containers, take a gas reading at several locations inside the car to determine that the air in the car is safe. You should also count the number of containers and check it against the number that the sign shows were put aboard. Your count must agree with this number. If it does not, consult your supervisor for instructions. Dispose of the residue in the usual manner by stirring into a bucket of water and liquid detergent. Remember that this must be done in the open air and all leftover materials, empty envelopes, contents of the bucket and other contaminated items must be disposed of in an approved manner. Basically the procedures for fumigation are straightforward and will not cause you difficulty. But there's one important point you must always remember. The materials are safe, provided you follow the rules. Don't get careless. Don't take shortcuts. And you'll find fumigation easy and free of danger.